Good morning. I invite you to please open your Bibles with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. And I'll be reading from verses 10 to 17, although we'll just be um, studying only verses 14 and 15 this morning, looking at the first half of the armor of God. Ephesians 6, 10 to 17. <clears throat> Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come before you once again in prayer this morning. We thank you, Lord, for the many blessings that you have given us. We thank you, dear Lord, for the um, blessings that we have in the heavenly places, as your word says. God, we thank you for saving us, for, um, for showing us the Lord Jesus Christ, and also, Lord, for making a provision for us to live the right Christian life, the right spiritual life. And Father, we thank you for our brothers and sisters here this morning that we can come together and worship in this way and lift up holy hands and worship you in spirit and in truth. Hear our prayers, O Lord, we ask. Be glorified, O Lord, in the praises of your people. Hear us, O Lord, hear our petitions that we bring before you, our Father. We ask that you would heal those that are unwell in their bodies, those that are sick. Lord, and above all, we pray that you would give us the strength to love you with all our hearts, O Father. And Lord, to walk this Christian life that you have given us. And this morning, we pray that as we look into your word, that you would speak to our hearts, that you would open our eyes and our hearts, that you would help us see and understand that which you want us to see and understand this morning. For we ask in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated, please. So last week, we looked at the first four verses in this passage that we read this morning, where Paul gives one final instruction to the church. And as he ends his letter to the Ephesians, um, he gives one last instruction, which is to be strong in the Lord, he says. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might to stand firm as Christians, as those who believe in the Lord. And for that to happen... He says that we need to put on the armor of God or take up the armor of God. It is something that we have to do. It's something that we have to put an effort into as God enables us. It is a part of our sanctification. It is a part of our Christian life. And, and we are called to make up our minds to be ready to do this thing. To put on the armor of God. And when we do that, 
the scripture promises us that, that we will be able to stand firm against the devices of the devil. The evil schemes of the devil, as he says. And, 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 and this, this is the enemy that we face, brothers and sisters, both as, both as individuals, as believers in Christ, and as, as a church of Christ. The enemy is the devil. He is the, he is, he is the enemy of, of, of us individuals as believers and the church. And he operates in, in very creative ways and means and methods. He's always up to something. He, he's got something up his sleeve all the time against the believer. And, and therefore, we are admonished by the scripture to stand firm. It cautions us to stand firm against him. And last week we saw that we really need this armor of God that God provides. We need that armor. We need it if we have decided and if we want to stand firm. And without it, you and I can claim to stand, but we will be brought down sooner or later. Trust me. Because the enemy is much, much smarter than any one of us here. So what is this armor? What does it include? And that's what we are about to find out in these next four verses here in, from verse 14 to verse 17. And from verse 18 onwards, Paul speaks of a very special spiritual discipline called prayer. Take a look at verse 18. So, so both these actions, because he says with all prayer and petition, the, there are two actions here. Both these actions of standing firm and praying is absolutely necessary for a strong and a complete uh, spiritual life. And Paul mentions prayer because that's how we come to a complete dependence upon God. It's not just our effort at standing firm. We, uh, you know, we, we might don the armor of God, but that's just not enough. Our spiritual life is incomplete without the spiritual discipline of prayer. And we're going to look at that next week or, or maybe the week after next because there's so much to study here about prayer and we don't want to rush through um, talking about prayer or, or even what we are studying here this morning about the armor of God. And, and by the way, who says that the Sunday morning service needs to be an hour and a half? I mean, I don't know where the modern church got that idea from, but, but we don't want to be people who do it that way because someone else does the same thing. And we, because you don't find a verse in the Bible that says, do like all the other churches in your neighborhood do. You won't find that. And when you look at church history, what you'll see is that there have been great outpourings of the Spirit, and there have been mighty revivals within the church, and, and revivals have, have broken out from within the church when, when people earnestly come together in authentic worship and, and, and in come to God in prayer. And friends, we want to be there when God visits us. Amen? So we are here in this last part of, of chapter 6, and I think there's a good place to, um, to mention this because we are talking about the spiritual life as our topic here in, in, in this text this morning, just like last week, and, and we'll probably dwell on this the next couple of weeks. We don't want to do what others do, friends. We are here for a purpose, and I believe that God has called us to go deeper with him. I believe that uh, God calls every believer to go deeper in Christ, but some do it and some don't. So if you are here this, this morning and if you are hearing a prompting of the Holy Spirit to go deeper with God, my brother, my sister, do it. Go deeper with him. Praise be to God that he has actually brought you to such a point in your Christian life that, that you might be thinking that even that you're thinking about such things. 
about a spiritual life in Christ, about walking with God, about plumbing the depths with God, about the things of God, and, and, and about, about living in a constant encounter with the Almighty God. And we'll have more things to say about, um, about the spiritual life as we progress along, as we study the topic of prayer too. But this morning, we are looking at six things that the scripture presents to us, and, and we call that as the armor of God. And it says, we can stand firm with it. And this morning, we are only doing the first three, verses 14 and 15, and we'll do the rest next week. So, so Paul has so far made a case for the armor of God. And he presents to the, uh, us um, in, in verses 10 onwards. And he ten, now, in from, from verse 14 onwards, he tells us the manner in which we must stand with this armor. What is this armor of God? And what does this armor actually consist of? There are six pieces to this armor. Please look at verses 14 and 15 here. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So these are the first three pieces, and, and we can group these three together because of the manner in which Paul presents it. You have truth, you have righteousness, and you have the gospel of peace here in the first set. And Paul presents faith and salvation and the word of God in the second set as, as an addition to the first three right here. So there's a difference between the first three pieces of the armor and the last three pieces of the armor and we'll see what those differences are next week. And like I've said before, this is just imagery that Paul uses. And the reason imagery is used in the Bible is so that the recipients of, of, of this letter, the recipients of whoever he is writing to can understand clearly what he is trying to say. It is so that he can create a mental image for his readers regarding the truth of what he's about to say in, in, in this passage. He says, stand firm, therefore. Basically, it is a posture of a soldier who is ready for, for any offensive that, that may come against him. And standing shows this readiness. And I want you to, to imagine this this morning. It is not sitting down. It is not laying down. It is not lounging around, relaxing. But it is standing. And standing firm, ready for battle. And it is definitely not retreating in the face of an offensive that is brought about by an enemy. And if you notice this passage very carefully, you'll see that this is the third time that he is saying, stand firm. Three times he says, stand firm. We have to stand our ground. That means there is something that you and I need to do. We need to be ready in terms of our spiritual life to be in a, in a position that is always ready for an offensive that may be brought against us. So if you're not ready as, as, as spiritual Christians, if we are not spiritual Christians, if we are not practicing our spiritual disciplines, then friends, we are easy targets for the devil to pounce upon us at any given point of time. Remember, the responsibility rests with us as the Lord enables to stand firm. So how do we stand firm? How do we do that? How do we stand firm? By putting on the armor of God. By putting on the armor of God. That's why the text says, having girded your loins, having put on the breastplate, having shod your feet. So if you do these things, and when you do these things, he says, you will stand firm. When you put on the armor, when you do these things that the scripture is calling the believer to do, then it assures us that we have done everything that we could do. 
that we have done everything possible, everything that we are supposed to do, and God will enable us to stand firm. Having girded your loins with truth, he says. Verse 14. So to gird oneself means just to bind oneself with something. That's what that, that word means. And loins just means your waist. And in the context of, of a first century soldier and, and an armor, you would bind yourself um, with that thing around your waist. And that's probably a belt. So this can be translated as by fastening your waist with the belt of truth. Or you can say by fastening the belt of truth around your waist. So, so this is the first piece of armor that he's talking about. It is the belt of truth. The belt of truth. And the belt is a very important part in the armor, you see. It keeps everything together. Much like um, a tool belt, if you will. And if you like working with tools, <clears throat> you'll know how important a tool belt is. Or, or just even an ordinary good leather belt around your waist is. You can latch all kinds of tools to it. It provides you with support. It, it keeps your trousers on your waist tight and keeps your tools within your reach and everything else within your reach. And it's the same with the belt of a soldier in a first century armor. It keeps the rest of the clothing and, and in its place. And it provides the kind of support that is needed for the rest of the armor. And it also provides some sort of protection around your waist. So the truth is the main idea, idea here, and, and, and the belt is just the imagery. You know, we should not be concentrating on the belt, but we should be concentrating on what the belt stands for, which is the truth. And he says, fasten yourself with the truth. Fasten yourself with the truth. Think about it. Now, what does that mean? What does, what does he refer to when he says the truth? Because people have all kinds of, of explanations about it. And some are very creative, I'll tell you. What he's talking about here is the content of our faith. Truth is the content of our faith faith, that the content of Christianity or the ultimate truth. And the content of our faith is the good news that Jesus took our sin upon himself, that he went to the cross for us, that he pun suffered the punishment on our behalf, and he sacrificed himself for us so that your sins and my sins may be atoned for. So that we may be forgiven of our sins, so that we might be reconciled back to the Father if we believe and put our trust in Him. That is the truth. And we know He is talking about the content of our faith really here because He introduces this right at the beginning of His letter. Please turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1 and look at verse 13. Ephesians 1. Verse 13, in him, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. So the message of truth is the gospel of our salvation. And the gospel is the good news that Christ has redeemed us. So Paul says here, Gird your loins with truth. Fasten the belt of truth around your waist. Let the truth of the gospel be the first armor or the first piece of the armor that you actually put on. Because it is the truth of the gospel that is the basis for your spiritual life, my friend. The truth of the gospel is just like a belt in a soldier's armor. My friend, you need to know what it is that you believe. You need to know what it is that you believe. If you, are, if you are not well versed with the gospel, that is, if you don't know the content of your faith or what it is that you actually believe, then you don't know that you are secure. 
You don't, have, you don't have the assurance of salvation if you don't know what it is that you actually believe. I mean, it is not enough to say that you believe in Jesus. You need to know what it is that you actually believe about him. You need to know what the gospel is. And the gospel, which is the truth, like Paul says here, is, is, is very clear in the way God has revealed it to us in, in, this, in this book, in the scripture. And I don't know of any other verse in the Bible that, that explains this, everything about the gospel so clearly than this one verse, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. I mean, you can take every part of it and, 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 and talk about it. You see, friend, God loved you and I so much that he sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die for us in our place. And the scripture says that if you believe that Jesus went to the cross for your sins, you will be saved. You will no longer be condemned. You will have eternal life because of your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has done for you. In sacrificing himself for you because of the trust that you place in the person of Christ. That he actually is who he, he says he is. That he is the son of God. That he lived a sinless life when he was on this earth. That he is the perfect sacrifice for the sins of the entire world. And that he, that he sacrificially paid off your debt once and for all. And he has given you the gift of eternal life. It is a gift. So this is the objective truth. This is the gospel. And when you, when you look at a passage like this, you'll, you'll have some other explanations too. So if this is the objective truth, what is the subjective truth? Some say that Paul probably is referring to the virtue of righteousness and, and faithfulness of the Lord Jesus Christ himself here when he says the truth. And where do we get that idea from? It's from Isaiah 11:5, which says, Also righteousness will be the belt about his loins, and faithfulness the belt about his waist. And, and some think that Paul is probably using Old Testament here and probably referring to that. They say that the, the, the truth that he is talking about here is the righteous quality of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if that's the case, then putting on the belt of truth means that you are putting on the righteousness and faithfulness of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And I think that that actually links back to what we have just said about the gospel. It's the same thing because by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us. So I believe that, that the truth here is referring to the gospel which Paul actually states quite explicitly right at the beginning of this letter. So practically speaking, what does this mean to us? What does it mean to us? The gospel becomes the first part of the armor that we take up. Not only to believe in it, but also to know what the gospel contains. To know the content of the gospel. And friends, the gospel is very, very simple. And yet, a lot of believers are confused about this very thing that they believe in. And that's because of all the false teaching that goes on among cer certain circles. So if you're confused about the gospel or if you're confused about the content of the gospel, you will not be able to do what the scripture is calling us to do this morning, which is to fasten the belt of truth around your waist. You will not be able to do it if you don't know what it is. So I invite you, my friend, to, to make an effort to understand what it is exactly that you believe. I invite you to dispel any wrong ideas, any notions that you may have about the gospel of Christ. Scrub it against the word of God, against the truth of the scripture. Don't just let any man tell you the meaning of what you believe. Go back to the word of God. Don't even believe me. 
Go back to the word of God and see what the word of God, this, this revelation of God says about what the truth is, what the gospel is, and what the gospel consists of. And we need to be good Berians. We need to do that. We need to go back to the word and understand the word like the way God has revealed it to us. Secondly, he says, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. So what is a breastplate? It is a piece of metal that covers the, the soldier's body from the neck up down to the hip and sometimes all the way up to the thigh and, and it is designed to protect the chest area and some other vital organs. And sometimes the breastplate, it's called a breastplate, but it also covers the backside of the soldier. It's something that you put on the front and the back. So the breastplate is a very important tool in the armor for the soldier's defense in a battle. Without the breastplate, he is quite vulnerable to, to all, kinds of, um, all kinds of weapons of the enemy, be it uh, arrows or swords or clubs or whatever the enemy might throw at you. And in today's term, you probably can compare it to a bulletproof vest, right? So if you're a cop or if you're a soldier, and no matter how good a shooter you are, you're not allowed to go into a combat situation without a vest. And Paul calls righteousness as this breastplate, as this vest, righteousness. He says, put on the breastplate of righteousness. It is, the, it is this righteousness that is going to protect you from the weapons of the enemy. And righteousness here is essentially the character of upright behavior. That's what it means in the, in the sense the way it is used here. Your uprightness as a virtue that becomes a part of the armor. And Paul is, is talking or say, telling us to, to put this on. But there's a problem, friends. You see, our righteousness is like filthy rags, the scripture says. Whether before God or even to protect us. It is like filthy rags. It cannot be our own righteousness that can actually indeed protect us. That cannot be a part of the armor. This is subjective righteousness. Our righteousness is unable to protect us because that's an inferior kind of righteousness. And if you want an example, it is at best, it, it can be compared to a breastplate that is probably made up of aluminum foil or something. An inferior material, a, any weapon that is thrown at you can actually easily pierce through that righteousness. So we need a righteousness that is indeed better than our own righteousness. We need a better kind of righteousness and, and the kind that is able to withstand the weapons of the devil. So we ask, where do we actually get this kind of righteousness from? Where do we get it from? And we know the answer because we, are, we, we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. It can only come from God, my friends. It can only come from God. It has to be given to us by God himself. And the scripture calls this the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God. So how do we get this righteousness? And the word of God says that this righteousness is manifested through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe in him. It is manifested through faith in Jesus Christ to, to all who believe in him. Romans 3.22 even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction, it says. And, and if you look at the scripture, if you look at the New Testament, it is full of references to this righteousness that we have in Christ because of our faith in him, because we believe in him. And Romans is full of it, Romans 4, 5. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as, as what? As righteousness. 
Romans 9.30, what shall we say then? The Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attained righteousness even, as, even the righteousness which is by faith? Romans 10.10, 10, for with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. Philippians 3.9, and may be found in him not having the righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. So Paul, this is, this is all Paul. And Paul is writing to the Romans, he's writing to the uh, Philippians, and he's saying the same thing here in Ephesians, because Paul is very, very clear about it. As believers in Christ, we have a righteousness that is far, far superior than our own righteousness. We have a righteousness that has been imputed to us as a result of our faith in Jesus Christ. And, and this righteousness actually gives us our right standing before God. This is, this is objective righteousness. This is the righteousness that is from God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is also the righteousness that is going to protect you and I, my friend, from the schemes of the devil. That is, if you do something. That is, if you do something. If you put it on, if you take it up, as he says here, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, our job is to put it on. And someone might say, wait a minute, pastor. Didn't you just say that if we believe in Jesus Christ, his righteousness is actually imputed to us? Then why do, you, why do I have to do something? What do you mean by put it on? My friend, this is where the rubber meets the road. We have a righteousness through Christ that provides for our justification, meaning that when God looks at us, he looks at us through the righteousness of Christ. And that is how we are saved. We have our salvation through that justification. In that way, we have a better, a better righteousness than our own. But my friend, you could be a justified Christian today. You could be a justified believer with the righteousness of Christ, but you could, you could still be a rotten individual if you are living a carnal Christian life. Do we see that? What Paul is saying here when, when he says put on the breastplate of righteousness is to put it to practice. Put it to practice. Practice the righteousness that you have in Christ. The subjective part. And when you do that, when you practice the righteousness of Christ that you see in the scripture, by the way, which is the right way to live that we see in the scripture, it will actually provide you a defense against the schemes of the devil. So if you're here today and if you're concerned that your own righteousness may not be good enough to protect you against the enemy, first of all, I invite you to put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the minute you do that, the minute you do that, his righteousness will be your very own, as, as we see in scripture. And then as you grow in the Lord, which is your sanctification, you will grow in your subjective righteousness too. And this righteousness is what you will put on as a breastplate that will, that will actually pr provide you with the necessary defense against the wild acts or wild attacks of the devil. But you first got to come to Christ, my friend. You've got to come to Christ. And you have to have him impute his righteousness to you first. You've got to put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ first. And then you've got to commit yourself to growing in your sanctification as a Christian. So, as you can see, it's all a part of sanctification. Our spiritual life is a part of our sanctification. And when you do that, your protection is assured for you. And thirdly... He says, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. 
shod your feet. How many of you shod your feet this morning? Now, shodding your feet is, is basically all language for putting your shoes on. I mean, that's the, the, the literal meaning is to bind something beneath your feet, to strap something on. And, and you'll see that in various versions as to how they interpret this. Some will say strap, strap your shoes or put on your shoes or wear your shoes. And, and that's generally what he's referring to here is footwear or shoes. So you're securing your footwear under your feet. And in this context here, since it's a part of, of, of the armor of the first century, those shoes are worn tight. They have to be worn tight. And because when the, when the soldier wears his armor, he wears it in such a way so as to be prepared for anything. He's not just slipping his uh, foot into the shoes and not tying his lace. He has it on tight. And when you put those shoes on, you're ready to go. And Paul uses this imagery here to, of being ready all the time, being ready to go all the time with your shoes on, with what he calls as the preparation of the gospel of peace. The preparation of the gospel of peace. And the first thing that we ask here is, how is this different from the first piece of the armor? How is this different from the first piece of the armor, the, the belt of truth? Wasn't that about the gospel too? So what does, he, what does Paul mean by the gospel of peace here again? Since he says, shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And the answer is, are you ready for it? Paul is not talking about the gospel here. Paul is not talking about the gospel as we understand it in normal usage, as, as, as in the truth or the content of our faith. He's not talking about the gospel as in the good news concerning the way of salvation made possible by the death and resurrection of Christ. He's not talking about that because that's what we mean when we say the gospel, right? That's what we mean when we normally use the word gospel. And the Greek word that is used here is evangelion, from which we get evangelism and ev uh, all kinds of words with ev evangelism or uh, evangelistic or um, whatever. You get the point. So this word here is not a technical term in the Bible. The word evangelion is not a technical term in the Bible. So what is a technical term? They are words that, that always have the same meaning everywhere they are used throughout the Bible. That's what a technical term in the Bible is. And the word gospel, evangelion, is not one of those technical terms. It can mean the gospel of Christ, the gospel of Jesus, that is the good news concerning the, the way of salvation by his death and resurrection. Or it can mean the gospel of the kingdom. You have heard about the, the kingdom gospel. Right? The gospel of the kingdom. Or it can mean evangelism. Or it can mean any other combination with, with all of those things in place. So the word gospel that Paul uses here is in the sense of just good news. That's what it means. Good news, meaning it is just positive information about e important events that are worthy of celebration. Positive information about important events that are worthy of celebration. And, and we don't have much time to go through some of these examples in the Bible but if, or, or the New Testament, but if you were to just look at only the, only the book of Ephesians, only this letter, Paul writes in 113. Look at 113. There you'll see that it is the gospel of salvation. We read that this morning. But if you turn to 3.6, 3.6, there he uses the word to, to mean that it is a good news of the union between the Jews and the Gentiles. So here in our passage this morning in 6.15, Paul is talking about the good news of peace, meaning he says it is the gospel of peace, the good news of peace. And within the rest of the scripture, if you look at even the word peace, 
It is something that has always been associated with the salvation that is brought about by the Lord Jesus Christ. Peace, the word peace. So the peace that Paul is talking about here is actually peace between one another in the Bible. Or peace between a brother and a sister. It's harmonious relationships or, or it is freedom from disputes. That's all it is. Acts 10.36, the word which he sent to the sons of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2.17, and he came, he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. So it's all used in the same sense of a harmonious relationship between um, one another. And I hope you've been reading your Bibles according to the plan that we have. And did you know that most of the New Testament letters um, end with some sort of peace between people? Some sort of peace between one another. So when you study it, what you'll notice is this, this particular theme of peace becomes a major prayer. Or it becomes a benediction at the end of every letter in, in the New Testament. Peace is very important in the coming of the Messiah. And you can look at it. You, you, want, you want to go home and take a look at this. The endings in Romans, 2 Corinthians, Philippians, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, Hebrews, 2 Peter. They'll all have the same thing. They'll all say something like, the God of peace be with you. Or live in peace and the God of love and peace will be with you, it'll say. The God of peace sanctify you. May the Lord of peace grant you peace and so on and so forth. So they'll all say the same thing. The, the theme of peace is, is very strongly associated with the coming of the Messiah and the salvation that the Messiah brings. And here, Paul is talking about the same kind of peace. The Lord Jesus Christ, through his birth, through his life, through his death, through his resurrection, has accomplished peace between man and God. But not only that, he has also accomplished peace between everyone who believes in him, between the brothers and sisters in Christ. He has established peace between people within the church. It is the, it is, it is the promise of a harmonious relationship with one another. It is the freedom of disputes between one another. Look at how Paul begins this first letter. Uh, uh, turn with me to chapter 1, verse 2. You'll see that he says, Grace to you and what? Peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And remember the context of this letter. And we studied this a couple weeks ago. Not couple, many weeks ago. He's writing to whom? He's writing to the Jews and the Gentiles within the church. Chapter 2, verse 14, for he himself is our peace who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. Verse 15, by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. Verse 17, and he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. Chapter 4, verse 3, being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace, he says. So there, he's using all of these terms in the same sense. It has the same meaning. And Paul continues here in, in the, with the same theme and he says, be ready with the readiness of the good news of peace. Now, what does that mean to us? What does that mean to us? The simple meaning is that you and I need to be always ready to, to be people that will resolve disputes. We need to be people that are always ready to resolve disputes with one another and live in harmony with one another. We need to be people that are always ready to, to bring in peace into a situation of turmoil. We need to be that kind of people. So if there is a, um, 
some sort of misunderstanding perhaps or possibility of a dispute between you and another person or between a brother or a sister in, in the Lord, between someone in the church, they must always know that when you show up, when you show up or when you get involved, you will be someone who will try to resolve that situation, that you will put to rest any animosity that is between people, between one another, and thus making peace with one another, that you are actually a peacemaker. They must know that when you show up, everything will be all right because you are a man or a woman of God. You are a man or a woman of peace. A peacemaker. Now why is that? Why does Paul ask us to be people that are this way? I think first of all it's because we are saved by the Messiah who came to bring peace between God and man and between man and man, between brothers and sisters in the Lord. And, I, and, and secondly, we are a people with an eternal perspective in mind, right? Right? And none of this that we quibble about today, none of this is going to matter in eternity. So when we present ourselves as, as people that are ready to be peacemakers, who bring in the good news of peace into a peaceless situ situation, what a great testimony that will be for our Lord Jesus Christ. And besides that, as the armor that Paul presents here, he says, what does he say? By shorting, by shorting or shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So by doing so, by shorting our feet with this good news of, of, of peace, by being peacemakers, it'll help us stand our ground and stand against the devices of the devil who might try to bring disunity and disagreement within the body of Christ. That's why he compares this to the pieces of armor. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who announces peace and brings good news of happiness, Isaiah 52, 7 says. So friends, do you see that although Paul is, is, is using the imagery of an armor, of truth, of, of, of righteousness and peace for the Christian, for the believer, for you and I, the armor of God is not an instrument of offense. It is an instrument of defense against the enemy. So brother and sister, my friend, we have looked at three things this morning. We need to fasten the belt of truth that is, be well versed with the content of the gospel. We need to put on the breastplate of righteousness, that is, practice righteous living. And we need to fit our feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, that is, be men and women of peace. And when you have done this, when you have done this, along with the other three that he's going to talk about in the next few verses, you will be able to stand firm. You will be able to stand your ground against the schemes of the devil. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word once again. We thank you, Lord, for the great resources that we have in the scripture, the truth of the word of God, the truth of the gospel, the righteousness that we have in Christ. And Lord, the call to be peacemakers, the good news of peace that you brought so we can be peacemakers ourselves. Lord, we thank you that you have given us all these heavenly blessings, the spiritual blessings in the heavenly places, as Paul says. And we are grateful to you for it, Lord. We pray that we, we may take this to heart that we may practice these things, that we may grow in our sanctification, that, Lord, that we might be people that, that you want us to be, spiritual Christians, not carnal ones, O oh Father. Help us bring glory and honor to you in the way we live. 
For we ask in Christ's name. Amen.